Heading into 2024, China is already in a recession across the board. There has been a slump in exports, almost stagnant growth in domestic demand, a significant drop in total manufacturing output and sales, a nearly collapsed real estate sector, and a variety of slumps in most service sectors. February 10, 2024 was the Chinese New Year, and the Chinese mainland was on holiday for eight days. As the holiday wrapped up, consumption data came out, with officials boasting of an active and bustling domestic consumer market. Is this really the case? In this episode, we'll find out if China's economy is starting to pick up, or if it's heading for a recession. Let's start with a scene of a Chinese boy's demand of his grandparents. <laughs> this scene isn't surprising. If you live with all the official data and media coverage that the CCP feeds you, you will likely be under the same illusion. The data center of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of China recently released data stating that there were 474 million domestic travel trips during the New Year holiday, and domestic tourists spent a total of 632.687 billion yuan. The sales of key retail and catering companies across the country increased by 8.5% year-on-year on a comparable basis. The official media worked hard to propagate the claim that China's economy had a good start in the new year, judging from the new year consumption data such as tourism, catering, commodities, transportation, and movies. Our country's overall household consumption of physical goods have entered quality upgrading stage, so we push trading of traditional consumer goods to spur investment infusion into developing new products while better meeting the potential demand of consumers. However, we observe that although consumption in China picked up during the Chinese New Year period, there is, in essence, an element of false prosperity in the current consumption. Behind the consumption of hundreds of billions is the shrinkage of trillions. It's like a lipstick economy. Lipstick economy refers to an economic phenomenon that causes lipstick to sell hotly due to an economic depression. It's also called the low price product preference trend. Sober Chinese have sensed something is wrong, including in the popular film YOLO during the Chinese New Year period. The Chinese government is very proud of the movie, which is full of inspirational messages for Chinese people. But professional insiders have said that something doesn't feel right. Now that we have produced such a hot movie, how much is the box office today? More than 3 billion yuan. The final estimate may be more than 4 billion, or even if it exceeds 560 million. To be honest about this movie, I am not afraid of being rectified, but its quality isn't all that good. Why? All the selling points of this movie are centered on the inspirational role played by the actress. If you ever watched the original Japanese movie, 100 yen love, you know almost all the plots are plagiarized. There's nothing you can do about it. It's a common phenomenon in China. It's a tumor in the Chinese movie industry. Look at the recent movies. All of them are plagiarized from Japanese and Korean movies. Why? It's easy to copy. They are light comedies and don't touch on Chinese society's conflicts or sensitive topics. They won't lead to the risk of being censored and they can still earn high box office, or rather cheat high box office. So why should anyone film those heavy subjects? If this continues for a long time, it is like bad money driving out good. The cultural brainwashing of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, isn't the focus of this episode episode. So let's return to the economy. Currently, in China, recovering consumer spending is a very important issue. A country where money is not flowing is in big trouble, especially when the decoupling of the economic ties between the West and China is becoming irreversible, and D china has now become the consensus in the West. China faces a deadlock, that is, money isn't flowing. From investors and entrepreneurs to ordinary people, everyone is afraid of spending money. 
At its essence, it's a crisis of confidence in the national economy. The confidence crisis has caused at least three main types of overcapacity in China. The first kind is production capacity. China's manufacturing industry is in overcapacity. Its production rate of many industries is less than 50%, or even only 20%. Issues like a lack of demand, people with little money, and what's produced cannot be sold have all led to overcapacity. Except for some industries that haven't been deregulated, there are issues like excess capacities in production, insufficient orders, and low profits. With foreign capital leaving China, unemployment has increased. Reduced demand has further aggravated the overcapacity problem. The second kind of excess is financial capital. Many banks have more deposits than loans. Enterprises don't invest, people don't spend, and the money isn't flowing into the real economy but hangs around in the financial system. Banks can't lend out but also have to pay interest to others. There is an excess of financial capital. The third kind of access is the number of businesses. Nowadays, the streets are full of shopping malls, drugstores, hotels, and milk tea shops. China's relevant research institute has conducted a survey. There were 420,000 drugstores in China in 2012, and by the end of 2022, there were 620,000 drugstores in this country. In other words, there are at least four to five pharmacies on one street. Some people may say, aren't the big investment companies in China still making big investments? What's the real story? Let's listen to a former angel investor in China. Let me tell you something brutal. 70 to 80 percent of the current investment in China comes from the government. As an ordinary citizen, you may not know that. The top of the investment company is called LP, that is the funder. In the past, many of the LPs were listed companies and some of the founders of investment companies who cashed out. Because in the past, the listed companies were very prosperous. And after they made money, they would feed back into the investment market. But now you will find that these people have no more money, right? They don't dare to invest anymore, right? Then who are the people who dare to invest and still have money? It's the government. For example, the Shenzhen municipal government contributes at least RMB 20 billion a year to invest in big investment companies such as Zhenfang, Matrix, Fuel House Group. Group, etc. The biggest parent fund in China is the government. The city of Shenzhen is one of the most aggressive local governments in China. Shenzhen, Hefei, Suzhou, and Beijing, these places are all particularly big in terms of parent funds. And the parent fund is mainly the government's money. So, do you know what are the characteristics of government investment? It's policy driven, it's not market driven. It will make demands. It will tell Tell you that you have to invest in five areas, A, B, C, D, E. Which five areas are there? New energy, hard and core technology, biopharmaceuticals and biomedical, new materials, integrated circuits and semiconductors. The government will specify the options for you, you know? It will tell you that you can only invest in these five sectors, and then you're given the one billion yuan. After the government has given Giving you the 1 billion, it will require these big investment companies to invest in Shenzhen. That means the company you invest in has to be local to Shenzhen, or you have to migrate the company's tax payments to Shenzhen. So I tell you, in fact, many people don't realize that 70 to 80 percent of the so-called venture capital firms are simply scared to take risks, and they have the government on top of them. Do you understand? So now, venture capital is not market-oriented. They don't use financial return as the only criteria anymore. China's venture capital is 70 to 80 percent policy-based and 20 to 30 percent market-based. What are the characteristics of the policy market? That is, it doesn't aim at short-term returns. For example, in the integrated circuit semiconductor industry, 90 percent of the companies in this industry are suffering huge losses. If they hadn't relied on government subsidies, they would have to close their doors tomorrow. Then you invested in such a company, you would become who knows what. You don't even know what you have invested in. This is what many people don't 
No, and it's one of the things that makes me hopeless about this investment environment. Voice of America published an article by a Shanghai-based political scientist in February 2024, titled "The Great Depression Is Coming: The Historical Moment of Shanghaiization." The article said that the atmosphere on the eve of this year's Chinese New Year was bizarre, as if the people were preparing for a depression the likes of which they had never experienced before. The Chinese are watching helplessly as this depression descends. The most obvious is that more businesses and factories have closed down early this year and gone on vacation more than ever before during the Chinese New Year. Businesses everywhere are in the doldrums, with bosses fleeing the country, becoming the new norm. According to the article, a domestic, power-driven, anti-market economy is becoming the dominant model in China. Over the past decade, China has been fundamentally and comprehensively sabotaged. The article argues that the destruction has been complete and reckless, resulting in a direct shorting of China's economy and even Chinese politics, which is the root cause of China's bearish politics and the inevitability of a Great Depression. An interview with a Shanghai resident conducted over the phone by an overseas Chinese language media verified the article's description of China and the economic misery of the city of Shanghai. I really can't believe it. 80% of the households in Shanghai are now nominally bankrupt. I mean, the loan business in Shanghai. Don't look at the surface. Some people appear glamorous, but in reality, they can't even afford a bowl of beef noodle for four dollars. Homeowners who want to sell their homes for cash can't find buyers. They can't even rent it out. And those who have taken out a loan to buy a flat are even worse off, as their meager monthly income are all spent on mortgage payments. And they don't dare to lose their jobs, because once they lose their jobs and break their mortgages, they won't even have any face left. This is the current situation of most families in Shanghai. Everyone is enduring, pretending to live well, and tell themselves that there is still a chance for the real estate market to recover. But I think Shanghai's real estate market is going to be in a long-term downward spiral. It's hard to recover. On various Chinese social media in China and overseas, a large number of Chinese netizens are describing the depression they have witnessed, including the closing of stores and businesses, the plunge in real estate, and the loss of jobs and stocks. Migrant workers at the bottom of the social ladder began a wave of wage collection before the start of the Chinese New Year and continued after the Chinese New Year holiday. This is a real estate project in a northern Chinese city where workers gathered at the sales office to demand their owed wages. The workers at the bottom of the ladder can't get their wages for years, and the bosses are suffering the same problem. The most recent shocking case is the story of a female entrepreneur in Guizhou Province who tried to collect money from a construction project. She undertook about ten government projects in the city and had been collecting payments for eight years. What was the result? At the end of 2023, on the day of the hearing at the Guizhou Higher People's Court, she was criminally detained by the local police on the charge of picking quarrels and provoking trouble. She was arrested for provoking trouble because the local government owed over 220 million yuan, or over U.S. 32 million, but was only willing to pay her U.S. 1.66 million. She refused it and was arrested on charges of provoking trouble. At the same time, dozens of people, including her lawyers, were criminally detained. In response, the woman entrepreneur wrote in an open letter. As I write this, I am in tears. As long as it isn't a death sentence, my purpose of living is: I must seek justice unless I am put to death. Another example is the logistics industry. It's described in the official Chinese media in this way. Reducing costs and increasing efficiency of the logistics industry is conducive to boosting the smooth flow of commodity factors and resources in a larger scope, promoting industrial restructuring and coordinated regional development, and ensuring that the upstream and downstream of the industrial chain can better optimize the layout according to regional endowments and institutional conditions. It'll help build up economies of agglomeration and scale, speed up the adoption of. 
digital and smart technologies push for integrated industries, thus promote to the formation of a large unified national market and improve the overall efficiency of the national economy. What is the reality? On February 25, 2024, Chinese beverage tycoon and founder of the Wahaha Group passed away. A truck driver in the logistics industry associated with the company wasn't in the mood to mourn him. Zhang Qinghou, founder of the Wahaha Group, has passed away. You're gone. Who am I going to collect my shipping fees from? At the beginning of last year, I hauled a truckload of Wahaha from Guiyang to a city in the southeastern part of this province. At that time, they owed me the transportation fee already. They owed me my hard-earned money. I made several episodes of video and complained on the platform, but it led to nowhere. Now that you are gone, who should I turn to to collect my hard-earned money? When I read this news over the past two days, to be honest, I'm not sad at all. Why? Although he contributed a lot of tax revenue for the government, his logistics suppliers owe how many drivers of their hard-earned money? Let's turn to Hebei province, a neighboring province of the capital Beijing. From February 23rd to 25th, 2024, in one of its counties, Jingdong delivery workers went on strike to protest against drastic pay cuts. Recently, Jingdong workers started more strikes in Jiangxi, Chongqing, and many other places. They complained that Jingdong's pay cuts reached a maximum of 35%. This is the city of Guangzhou, the largest region of garment factories in China. Two weeks after the Chinese New Year, workers have returned from their hometowns only to find that there were no jobs available. Tens of thousands of people are crowded here, lost in their search for work. Worst of all, the voices exposing China's false prosperity have disappeared in droves. Recently, Ge Long, a leading Chinese economist and founder of Ge Long Hui, an investment research platform in China, recently warned on its self-media. He said people must be vigilant against the three zeros in China's economy. He believes that if China goes down the road of isolation, China's economy may actually become an island economy forced to internal circulation. He summarized that people flow, logistics, and capital flow are the three core elements of economic development. The reasons for the shrinking to zero of these key data need to be analyzed clearly. If it's caused by the epidemic, there is still a chance to correct and adjust. But if it's caused by the trade war and political friction, it means that China's economy has already undergone a structural reversal. The future may really be unbearable for the current generation of Chinese people. Shortly after this video was released on February 23rd, his Weibo account, which had 378,000 followers, was completely cleared out. The reason given by Weibo is due to the violation of relevant laws and regulations, the user is currently in a state of suspension.